Okay, so welcome to the webinar. This is going to be a webinar on psycholinguistic studies, and we're going to focus on two different types of psycholinguistic studies. First, uh, we're going to talk about the visual world paradigm, which is a paradigm that allows us to study um, auditor auditory language processing. And we'll talk about how to program that in Experiment Builder and how to extract measures um, from data that you've collected using our data viewer software. Then we will shift gears and talk about how to do a reading study, so like present text on the screen, and I have a little example that um, presents text and then asks a question about the text and collects a response. And we can talk about how to program that, how to do the automatic interest area segmentation for it, and how to extract the measures from data viewer and from another piece of software. Um, so after this is all done, I'll p uh, post a link on the forums and I will like maybe mention the time where the reading section starts or something so people can jump ahead. Anyways, uh, let's get started. So um, first we'll go to, I've got a lot of things open here. I got my visual world example here open. I have the reading example open. And I, have, I, I figured we would start with a little PowerPoint about the visual world paradigm that I made. So um, hopefully this will work through the webinar software and the screen won't get weird, but I'm going to start this. Um, so this just is to describe the experiment builder project that we're about to start talking about. Um, so I just made like a little simple example and um, in this example on each trial the participant will, this is a very typical visual world paradigm example. So on each trial the participant will see four pictures on the screen and after a 500 millisecond delay from the time when the pictures appear um, they'll hear an audio file that will say click on one of the images. And one of these four images is going to be the image that they should be clicking on, so it's, we'll call it the target. Another one of the images will be a phonetic competitor, so maybe the beginning of the word sounds the same as the beginning of the target word. Another will be a semantic competitor, so maybe like in this little example, uh, grapes is a fruit and, and that's a target and the semantic competitor is another type of fruit. And then another will be an unrelated image um, in this case, in this example, umbrella. And I only had four image files, and so I just use the same images on every trial, but you, I'll show you how you can easily change those images from trial to trial. But the target and the competitors and the distractor will move around to different positions so that they're not always presented in the same location. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that. Um, and kind of critically, a lot of people forget this, like, I, I set up the example so that it's going to mark with a message uh, the time of the utterance of the critical word in the audio file so that that is like marked in the data file so that when you go to do the analysis you can kind of use that as like a time locking point to look at like a baseline period before that audio, before that critical word is spoken and uh, eye movement data after that critical word is spoken. Um, so that's super important. We'll talk about that. And then um, just to mention, like after the participant clicks on one of the images in this example, um, it'll give a little feedback saying correct or incorrect. So I, I just, like I can't, I know that I can't run the experiment builder project and have you properly see it um, using this webinar software. I've tested that. Um, so I just kind of in, tried to show what would happen in this PowerPoint. Um, and so, oh, sorry, I should mention the trials are going to be divided into five blocks, uh, one practice block and four experimental blocks the experimental blocks will be put in randomized order and the order of the trials within each block will be randomized. And I set it up so that you could have two different kind of versions or lists or counterbalances, whatever you want to call it, of um, the trials that a given participant will see. So the same project will handle uh, two different versions and you could do more than two different versions but just for simplicity that's what I did in this example. Um, okay, so let me show you how a trial will proceed. So the participant... Oh, that, that was a little bit premature. So they would actually just see this, um, I don't know if you could hear that click on the grapes, but anyways, they're going to see just like a uh, fixation cross and there's going to be a little region specified around that. When they look at that fixation cross, the trial will automatically start and the then they're going to see four pictures and they're going to hear instructions. I'm not sure whether you could hear, but I just heard it say click on the grapes. and. Um, 
then the subject will come and like click on one of the four images. So if I click on the grapes here, it should give some feedback correct. Okay, something like that. And then the next trial will start. And uh, just to foreshadow like the data analysis part, like often when people are doing these visual world studies, they want to make a graph that looks something like this. Okay, so what we have on the x-axis down here is time. And on the y-axis, we have the percent looks. So it's kind of like within each time interval, it's the percentage of like time that they spend looking at that particular image. And this is like average across subjects and across trials. And I just set up like four little time windows at the bottom. In reality, you probably have a lot more time windows. And so usually people break it down into like 10 or 20 millisecond bins. Um, on the x-axis, but just for simplicity, I, I just broke it down into like a baseline period, which would be before the critical word is spoken, and maybe at some period, at some point, we have it kind of locked to this is the time when the critical word is spoken, and you're going to see soon after that, you're going to start to see more uh, looks to the target and to the phonolog phonological competitor, and then I guess once they hear the rest of the target word, the um, looks to the phonological one should drop off and the target look should increase and then maybe a little bit later we might see a small bump towards a semantic competitor so like towards the apple in the example and um, then all three of the non-target images looks should start to decrease and the and the percent looks to the um, target should increase and so what people typically do is like look at kind of comparison across groups in a region like this or in a region like this um, and we'll talk about how you can generate like a, a results file from our data viewer software, we call it a report, um, that would allow you to make a graph like this and do your statistical comparisons in a, in a software package like R, R or MATLAB or SPSS or whatever you prefer for stats. But anyway, so the end goal is to have something like this and to have something that we can use to do the stats. Okay. So with all that being said, let's uh, get out of this PowerPoint and open up this little, I call it visual world auto drift check um, because I've kind of programmed in for the trial to have like an automatic drift check rather than a, a drift check that would require the experimenter or the subject to press a key to start the trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. <clears throat> Um, this example I'm going to post on the on the same thread in the webinars section of our support form so that you can download this and, and check it out and use it as a, as a template for your experiments. But anyways, um, if you want, like, in this webinar we're not going to talk about the very basics of Experiment Builder, like we're not going to talk about actions and triggers and other, these are the different node categories and we're not going to talk about how to connect them and do all these basic kind of uh, building uh, functions. If you want to like learn about the basics of Experiment Builder, you can go to our support forums. So www.sr-support.com is where you saw the webinar announcement. And there's a video tutorial section here, Experiment Builder video tutorial series. Um, this describes like a very simple experiment and describes like all the kind of basics of Experiment Builder. We will cover some of the basics in this, but um, this is kind of assuming you have like at least a basic knowledge of it. So if you're watching this video now after the webinar, you might want to take a break and go and, and learn the basics before you come back to this one. Um, but I'll try and make it simple enough that we can all follow along here, uh, make my discussion simple enough. Um, another resource for learning the basics of Experiment Builder is the previous webinar. Um, so if you go into this webinar section, first webinar, Introduction to Experiment Builder. So that's another one that just discussed kind of the basics. Um, and if you go in there, you can see like there's a link to the video from that, and there'll be something similar in this one. So uh, let's talk about this example. So this is the kind of topmost level of the experiment. And you can see there's just like a display screen action here, and we can double click on it to see what it's doing. And I just typed in some placeholder instructions. You could type in whatever you wanted. I use a multi-line text resource, so you could double click on this and edit this text if you wanted. Um, but that's just going to be the instructions. That's going to be presented at the beginning. And you can see we're waiting for one of two triggers to occur. So I used a keyboard trigger and a mouse trigger here. And so when one of those things occurs, 
it takes us into the camera setup mode so that we can calibrate the participant. Uh, we'll point the camera, focus the camera, adjust the thresholds, do the, do the calibration of the, of the participant. And then once all that stuff is done and, and we've calibrated and validated, um, we can press O on the host PC to start the experiment and then we'll go on to this, this next little section here. And this node is called a sequence and I've renamed it to block because this is our kind of going to handle our looping structure for our blocks. And you can see I've set the iteration count to five. So I mentioned there's going to be one practice block and then four experimental blocks. So we're going to have five little iterations of this block sequence. Okay. If we, and we're going to have a results file. I'll come back and talk about that later. Uh, but this is going to create basically a tab delimited text file that's going to just store uh, the independent variables we're manipulating and the behavioral data we're collecting in addition to the eye tracking data file. So this is like a nice little thing to do to, to allow you to quickly check kind of behavioral data for each trial, like reaction times and that kind of thing. Okay, so I'm going to double click on the block sequence and now I'm inside of that sequence and so all the events that are in here are going to happen five times. And you can see the first thing that we encounter is this special um, conditional trigger, which is like an if-then statement. And you can see over on the left how the, the conditional logic is set up for this trigger. And if we double click on, or if we click on the attribute property and then open up the attribute editor with this special button here, we can see that it's referring to the blocks iteration property. And it's checking to see if that equals one. And if a conditional trigger evaluates to true, so in this case, if we are currently on the first block, then the, then the experimental flow follows the path on the right with a little check mark. If it evaluates to false, then we follow the path on the left with a little X mark. And that will um, take us to a little break screen. So this screen just says take a break. I used a um, just simple text resource and change the text to take a break and, and I centered it in the screen. Um, so we're going to do a break screen and then wait for a keyboard press to move on to the trials of that block. And so the idea is like if you think about it what's happening here is on the first block we just calibrated the subject and they haven't really done any trials so they don't need a break. And so all we're doing is saying on the first block skip the break screen. Okay. Um, but on blocks two through five, we're gonna before the block starts, we do a little break screen and then go down to the trial sequence. And the trial sequence um, is gonna do like is gonna handle all of the practice and experimental trials. So I put everything into one sequence. This is by far the best way to use Experiment Builder. Like, don't fall into the rookie trap of like making separate sequences for the practice and the experimental trials because you'll end up duplicating a lot of your efforts and you'll end up actually making your data analysis a little more complicated. Um, so this one is going to handle all, in our case, 18. If you sum up these numbers, that's going to be 18. All 18 of our trials. It says 36 here because we have two versions, each with 18 trials. But anyways, this is going to handle all 18 of our trials but if you notice, it's split by property is set to 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. And this is basically telling how many iterations of this sequence we're going to do on each iteration of the outer block sequence. In other words, how many trials are we going to do on each block? So we're going to do two trials the first block, four trials the second, four the third, etc. Okay. And the trial sequence, since it's going to handle like our kind of um, manipulation of which images to show and that kind of thing. This is the sequence to which I've attached the data source. So you can see all sequences, and I just went back to the topmost level, all sequences including the block sequence have a property called data source. And usually the non-trial level sequences are going to have an empty data source. In other words, you're not going to use the data source. And usually at the, the sequence that's looping and doing your kind of trial looping, that's going to have the data source associated with it. And you can click on that data source property to bring up the data source editor. Okay. So what I've set up here is um, a little spreadsheet. We call it data source. And this is going to contain the information that's going to change from one trial to the next. 
So each row is actually going to represent like a different iteration of uh, this trial sequence. So in other words, each row is a different trial. And the columns are going to contain the information that's going to change from trial to trial. And as I mentioned, like I only had four images, so I just used the same ones over and over, and I only had one audio file, so I just used that over and over. But when you create a legitimate, like real experiment, you would change the image files that are specified in these, in you know all the other rows. Um, so let's just quickly go through uh, what these columns are going to do. So the identifier column is just going to be like a unique identifier for each trial. Um, and like I just like to do that to have some kind of easy way to identify things. I probably should have used different numbers for for the trials in the second counterbalance, which are down here. Um, but you know you can change that easily. So we got a unique identifier here. We have a little variable that that keeps track of what condition. And I just use generic like A, B, C, and D. But if you were manipulating something like like maybe um, which letter a word starts with or like what category a word or the target word was in like fruit or vehicles or something like that then this you would use a column that's doing something like this to keep track of any any kind of indip independent variables you're manipulating. Um, then I have another little column here that is just used to actually help us kind of control the randomization options um, and so it's going to basically keep track of whether it's a practice or training block trial or a non-training uh, block trial. Um, then we have a column that tells us what the target image is going to be on each trial. And this is the one where you want to have different names here. This is one of the ones where you want to have different names. Then we have another column that's going to tell us what the phonological competitor is, another one what the semantic competitor is, Another one that tells us what the dis the distractor image is, and then we're going to have a column that tells us the audio file that's going to be used. Then we have a column that is called crit word time, and this is supposed to, like, I, I just use kind of like made up numbers here, um, and actually since I use the same audio file all the time, these should probably be the same. But the idea here is this is like how long into the audio file in milliseconds, like from the start of the audio file, how long is it before the critical word is spoken? So this is like the time of the onset of the critical word in the audio file. So you would really need to like take your audio files and open them with an audio editing software like Audacity or like Adobe Audition or like any, any kind of thing where you can look at the waveform and find the time when the critical word is spoken, write it down or type it in here and then basically populate this column with the times of the critical word onset for for each of the audio files. And if you had several different critical words in each audio file, like maybe time of noun phrase one onset, time of verb onset, time of noun phrase two onset, something like that, then you would have one column for each critical word that you're interested in. Okay, and in each one you would put the time from the very the time from the zero point of the audio file. Okay, then I have four columns here, um, these four here, that are specifying the location of each of the four images in each trial. And I actually just, I didn't put the XY coordinate, which is kind of how you would more simply do this. Instead, I put one, two, three, and four to represent, basically, let me get back to the PowerPoint, like this is position one, two, three, and four. Um, so I just put in those numbers to kind of code these things so that I wasn't typing in like x, y pixel coordinates in here. And hopefully it will make sense why that's a little bit simpler than typing in the x, y pixel coordinates here. Although you could do x, y pixel coordinates, um, you would have to change this to point and change some of the way the project's structured. But, but hopefully this will make sense later. But this is just trying to code the position of the, each of the four images for each trial. And then I have uh, two other columns here. Block is used to help control the randomization. So I mentioned that we're going to have four blocks of experimental trials. And so you can see that the practice trials have a value of zero. And then each of the four blocks has a different number here. And that's used to help us do the randomization. And the counterbalance column is to help us have two different lists. So you can see the first 16, or first, sorry, 18 rows have a value of one here. Oops. And um, 
the last 18 rows have a value of 2. So just to kind of remind you of how randomization works, um, you can see I did a blocking level 1 and I chose this training or not column and so that's going to force all the trainings to come before the non-trainings and I set randomization type to none so the trainings will always come first so we're not we're not randomizing whether trainings or non-trainings come first and that's to force the, these training or practice trials to come first then I use blocking level 2 this block column over here and this is the one that forces us to have the four different um, experimental blocks um, so we have the four ones, four twos, four threes, and four fours here, and you can see I've chosen, and that'll make the the ones that have one stay together, the ones that have two stay together, etc. And I'm randomizing the order of those four blocks by checking by changing randomization type to random. So that's the this is the thing that's going to put our experimental blocks in a random order, and then to make it so that each the trials of each block are presented in a random order, I checked enable trial randomization. And then finally, I chose this counterbalance column as the splitting column, and that's going to make it so that when we run the experiment, it's going to ask us whether we want to use counterbalance 1 or 2, because those are the different values that we have in this column. And if I choose 1, then it will only run the first 18 rows, and if I choose 2, it would only run the last 18 rows. So that's the way we can have one experiment builder project handle multiple counterbalances or versions or lists or whatever you want to call them. Okay, so that's our little data source here, and let's go back. So I'm going to go back to the, let's go into the trial sequence, and um, let's uh, first walk through this little structure in here. So basically what we're going to do here, and we're going to come back and talk about it in more detail, but at the beginning of each trial, we're going to check to see basically whether the previous trial was aborted early because the subject couldn't fixate on that fixate fixation cross so you know at the beginning of each trial said there'd be a fixation cross like this if they don't fixate that within a certain amount of time then the trial will just end automatically because we're, we're assuming that either the subject's gotten distracted or they the calibration is bad or something like that but anyways it's going to set a, the value of a variable um, in a certain way and that variables value is going to be checked by this um, conditional and if it's been set to indicate that the last trial was aborted because of failure to fixate then we put a little message saying um, press any key to go back into camera setup mode so that you can recalibrate revalidate and then after a key press it takes us back into that camera setup mode action Actually, I change this. I'm going to try to make this calibration type consistent with the the calibration type of at the beginning of the experiment. Okay, but anyways, the idea is like if the previous trial boarded due to failure to fixate, then we go back into camera setup mode and then start the trial. If everything went fine, then we go ahead and start the trial. Okay, and so we'll see in a second how this this thing works. But um, so this is the structure that's looping and doing all of our trials. And then just like in all of our other like experiment builder examples, we have an innermost sequence that's called recording. And it is not used to do any looping. It's just used to control the recording of the eye tracker. So you can see its record property is checked. And we've checked is real time. So this, these are things discussed in, in those videos I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, you can see its iteration count is one. So you can see it's not doing any looping. Instead, it's just on each trial, we're going in there, it's sending a command to start recording to the host PC and eye tracker. In other words, start doing the eye tracking. We'll do all the events that are inside that sequence, and then at the end of that sequence, when we exit out, it'll send a command to stop recording because that record property is checked. Okay, so in other words, like the critical trial events are all housed inside this recording sequence. And if we double click and go inside this recording sequence, um, let me just kind of clean things up a little bit so we can read the names um, and zoom in some. I'll kind of walk through what's happening. Zoom in here, and I can use this overview panel to move around. Um, so I got. Let's talk about these four variables that are going to be used here. Um, I just added these from the other section, and uh, the first variable is called should we recalibrate. I've made it be an integer with a starting value of zero. 
um, it becomes an integer when you type in an integer here, and so you give it starting value. So this is the, the variable that's going to basically be set at the beginning of the trial. Um, if if it's going to be set to a one if they failed to fixate, so um, that's going to be used at the beginning of each trial, as I mentioned, to determine whether we need to go back and recalibrate. Um, and so at the very beginning of each trial, we set it to zero. Then we present the fixation cross, and we wait and uh, if they fixate, that's fine. We just do the trial. If they don't, then and the timer elapses, then we're going to set the value of this to one. Okay, so that's just used to help us control the experimental flow and to go back into a recalibration between trials if we need. The RT that stands for reaction time. This is meant to, um, or this will uh, store how long it takes for them to respond. Um, like by clicking on one of the four images. Okay, so that's going to be set at some point after they click. The region clicked is going to store uh, whether they clicked on the target, uh, competitor one, competitor two, or distractor, something like that. And then accuracy is going to be set to one if they click on the target and to zero otherwise. And you can like quickly take the mean of the accuracy variable in data analysis to see um, the percent correct, something like that. Okay. So these are going to be our behavioral data variables, and uh, it's kind of similar to some of the other examples that we've talked about. So at, let's go through each node here. At the beginning of the trial, we're using one of these update attribute actions, this one here, to reset these variables. Um, and so if we want to see how an update attribute action works, we can click on its attribute value list property. And you can see this one's going to have four rows. So we have four rows here. And you can see we're making a reference to the should we recalibrate variables value here. We can just check it here if we want to double check that. Um, we're making a reference to the RT variables value here, region clicked value here, and accuracy value here. And so we're just kind of resetting them to a default value. And basically, I want to reset should we recalibrate so that like, if the previous trial was aborted, we're not seeing the lingering one value from the previous trial that would tell us that we need to recalibrate. And so we're just basically kind of resetting that to zero. Um, then we're resetting the RT to a negative one. And I choose negative one basically just because it's a ridiculous and like crazy value that would not be a legitimate reaction time. And so if I go to do my data analysis and I see a negative one, it's going to mean either there was like a problem in the programming or that maybe it the trial timed out if I've, if I've built in like a timeout function into a project. So I like to just reset behavioral data values to some kind of meaningless value. So I use negative one here since it's an energy variable. I use just a simple period for since region clicked is a string variable. And I used negative one for accuracy um, since that's an integer variable. So we're just resetting the variables there. And then if we double click here, we're presenting this fixation cross. And I, I just like to do it simply, I just used a text resource and I uh, used a, like a plus sign and I centered it on the screen. Um, in, in this project, if I go to the devices tab, of the structure panel, we can check like the eye tracker settings and the display settings. And you can see I used a resolution of 1920 by 1080. So we're using 1920 pixels horizontally and 1080 pixels vertically. And so like if I check this resource, you can see it's basically it's been centered on the screen here. And it's just one off because it's an odd number of pixels in size. Um, and I just use, use these buttons to center it. Um, so I, I just drew a fixation cross, and then I created an interest area here using this little button there. And I named it cross, and that's the label that I gave it, but I also gave it a data viewer name of cross because that's the name that we're going to see when we do our data analysis. So this, this property is actually more important than the label. Um, and you can see I also centered it and gave it a width and height of 150. And so I'm, I'm not really we're probably not going to care like in data analysis about this interest area. I mean, to be honest, I mainly just used it to, sorry, to uh, control this invisible boundary trigger that comes after the display cross. And so if you, if we look at the, what happens after the display cross, one of two things can happen. Either one, 
this invisible boundary trigger fires, and we can see over here that that invisible boundary trigger is linked to that, that cross interest area because I've selected that display screen action and that interest area. There's only one interest area in there. And I checked within to make sure that this is going to fire when the eye is within that region and not when it's outside that region, which would happen if within is unchecked. And then I put the minimum duration to 500, which means that the eyes have to be in that region for 500 consecutive milliseconds for this um, invisible boundary trigger to fire. So if that fires, it's going to take us on and basically start the trial. If instead 10 seconds elapses and, the, and they haven't looked at it, then this other parallel branch will be followed because this trigger will fire. And you can see what will happen next is this node called set recalibrate, which is like the, it's like an update attribute action. This one is going to set the value of that should we recalibrate variable to one. Okay. And so that's the thing I was talking about at the beginning of each trial. If we go up a level, this conditional checks the value of that variable should we recalibrate. And if it is one, we go this way and do our little recalibration. And if not, we go this way. All right. The only reason like I didn't have to do all this should we recalibrate and like draw my own fixation cross. I could have instead just used like this uh, drift check action and put it right after the prepare sequence action. And you'll see a lot of our examples have that type of thing. The only reason I did it this way is because I visited a lot of um, labs that do visual world stuff and it seems like a lot of people that do visual world studies ask about an automatic drift check and so I just figured let's build this in there and just kind of like you know talk about how to do that too and so you can see it's actually really not that complicated to build that in so um, so it's kind of like an automatic drift check so it doesn't rely on the experimenter or the participant to press a key to start the trial as the built-in drift check node would okay so this one would require space bar press or, or, or button five press on the button box if you're using one of those. So <clears throat> the idea is just to like keep us from having to use that. Okay, anyways, let's go back in the recording sequence. Um, so if you know it timed out, then we set the value that should we recalibrate, and then we do this recycle data line. So they actually, at this point, you'll see they never got any of the trial images. They just got to the fixation cross. And so we don't want to like just discard this trial altogether. And so what this this special node that's called um, recycle data line will do is basically just take the row of the data source that they're currently on, and it it takes into account the randomized order. So it's going to you know use the current tr trial regardless of you know whether you're randomizing or not. And so it's going to um, take that trial and recycle it so that we don't skip it. You know what I mean? And so when we come back, so this trial will abort, and then we're going to come back to the next iteration of the trial sequence, and we're going to do that same trial. We're going to use that same row again so that we don't um, abort or just discard that trial altogether. And we, that should be fine because we never actually did the trial anyways, so it's, it's actually good that we're going to recycle it. And um, you should be able in data analysis to, to basically discard all the trials that have a value of should we recalibrate of one because those will be the trials that were aborted and you, should, you can just discard them in data analysis. Okay, but anyways, um, so we're going to display the fixation cross, wait for uh, invisible boundary trigger or timer, and then if the invisible boundary trigger fires, then I'll come back to this one. Let me let's just take a look at what's going to happen. This this is just going to set the value of of some mouse stuff, but let's take a look at the display screen action. So you can see here, there's a little image resource that I've added that is going to be our mouse cursor. So there's not like a built-in mouse cursor that would automatically happen in Experiment Builder. In fact, we want to hide the mouse cursor usually because we don't want people to be distracted by that during calibration and during the actual experiment. So if you want to use a mouse cursor in Experiment Builder, the easiest thing to do is go to Edit, Library Manager, and under the Image tab, just like import an image that looks like a mouse, and you can take the one from this project if you like it. Um, but it, you know, you can import any image, and then you can um, check this property, position its mouse contingent, and that'll make this mouse cursor move around. We're going to talk about these images in a second, but um, this 
this is going to be the cursor that they use to click on one of the one of the images. And so, um, like, just as any mouse cursor, like it's going to stay, it's going to be presented at, you know, the loc the current mouse location, like mouse device location. Okay. And so, like, let's say on the previous trial, if they clicked on the target. We don't want that mouse cursor to like be on the previous trial's target location. Okay, we want to probably recenter it on each trial because people just have a tendency to look at a mouse cursor, you know, because that's where they're using the do the clicking, and we don't that could bias them to look at one of the four images. And so what we're going to do before we actually present the images is recenter this mouse cursor. So if we go back here to the recording section, uh, recording sequence. You can see right before we present the images, I'm using this update attribute action called reset mouse position to set the X coordinate of that mouse device, which I got down from the devices section here under the mouse device. I referenced the X position. We set that to halfway across and we set the Y position to halfway down. So that'll center it on the screen. And we do that right before we present the images. This isn't necessary, but I think it's a typically a good thing to do in a visual world paradigm. Okay, so let's go back into this. Uh, oh, actually, I should mention one more thing about the mouse cursor. So this image file that I'm using, um, it's like an image file I created. Um, but like, let me bring it up here. The outside of that image file has one color. And the inside has a different color. So the, I think the inside is 255, 255, 255 in the RGB color. And the outside is 253, 253, 253. Okay, I'm, I'm mentioning this because an image file is a rectangle, right? And, like, we wouldn't want the subject to see, like, when they go to do the, the trials, we wouldn't, wouldn't want them to see, like, a, re a white rectangle with a little arrow inside it. You know what I'm saying? And so I set it up so that the outside of the image file has one color and the inside has a different color, and they're both close to white. And if we go to the Devices tab of the Structure panel and go under the Display section, you can see all Experiment Builder products have a property called Transparency Color. And if I bring that up, you can see I've set that to 253, 253, 253, which is the outside of that image file. And so the outside file, uh, part of that image file will basically be invisible, and we're not going to see a little white box with an arrow in it. So I just want to point that out. That's how you can make this look like a proper mouse cursor. Okay, so anyways, that's the mouse stuff. That's how we're going to see a mouse cursor. And then you can see what I've done here is like add four image resources and I use just this button here to add an image resource and I kind of position them it didn't really matter where I position them on the screen because they're just placeholders okay and they're gonna get their location from references and they're gonna get the actual image file that's used from a reference okay and so I added four of these of these image resources and I renamed them target image phonological competitor image semantic competitor image etc and so each one of these is a different one of the image types. Um, and then this one here that's just called image resource and mouse cursor. And let's take a look. Okay, so um, let's take a look first at the source file name property. So if I just went back, like if I just added this image file, after you add it, you would see the name of the image file like this. Okay, so in this case, um, like if I click on here and add a new image resource, you can choose any of the image files in your library. And you and you can add it. Okay, I'm going to delete that. But when you after you add it, it become like it's it'll list the name of that image file there. We don't want to display that same image file on every trial. That would be I mean I know in my example we're doing that because I just use the same file name here. But we would in a real experiment use a different file name here, and we would um, make a reference to that data source column. Okay, that's going to specify the name of the image file to be used. We make a reference to that from the source file name property down here. So if I click on that source file name property and then double click on this, or sorry, and then click on this button here, it brings up the attribute editor and I can find our trial data source and it lists all the columns in that data source and double click on target image and that'll make it use whatever image file is specified here on each trial and we would have different names here. Okay. Um, so I kind of skipped a step here, but the first step would be go to Edit, Library Manager, 
imp use the image tab to import all the images that you're going to use in your project. So you'd have a lot of these in here. I just have our five images here because that's all I had. Like import into the library manager, use an image resource to add it, to add a placeholder image. And then for each of the placeholder images for the source file name property, make, an, make a reference to one of your data source columns. And so let me just expand this a little bit. We can see that um, this one's referencing the target image column. This one's referencing the phonological competitor image column. This one's referencing the semantic competitor image column. And this one's referencing the distractor image column. And then I made four. So that's how the images are going to be presented. And then in terms of just the, the exact image file that's chosen, for each of um, those, I also made an interest area. The subject won't see these, but they'll be used to help us control the mouse clicking and to help us in our data analysis. I'll come back to that in a second. OK. So um, none, like we, we don't want the target like image to be presented in this weird position. We don't want this one to be presented in this weird position. We want them to be kind of presented in a nice orderly position like here, something like this. And we want them to be able to move around. So we don't want always the target to be in one court, in one quadrant. We want it to move around uh, to different locations. And so what I did is in this data source, I've made these four columns that specify the four positions, OK? One being top left, two top right, three bottom left, four bottom right. Now, what I could have done is just type in, like, literally, like, well, let me change. I, would, I could have changed this to a, a point type column which would expect an XY pair, and I could have just typed in like, you know, 480 comma 270, and that would, and then I could have made a reference to that column value from the image resources location property. But I didn't really want to type in all those different positions here, and if I wanted to tweak the position slightly, I didn't want to have to go back here and change it on every different row for each of these columns. So what I did instead was a little bit more complicated in terms of the reference, but it makes life a lot easier in case you want to make minor tweaks to the exact coordinates of each one. So let's go take a look at a variable that I included. And I, I, I put in the trial sequence. It doesn't really matter where you put it, but basically I made a variable called positions list, okay? And actually, I didn't, so I didn't type in the EB point. So I typed in something like this. Let me make a new document and show you what I typed in. Um, I just typed in, I just replaced that with nothing. I typed in something like this. So basically, I typed in a list of four XY coordinate pairs. And each coordinate pair is in parentheses. And the outer uh, entire list is in square brackets. And so if Python is the scripting language of Experiment Builder, and so if I just paste this into the value property here and then hit OK, it actually, you can see it automatically adds in that EB point for you. So it just kind of interprets it for you and says this is an Experiment Builder list. And um, so in reality, all I'm doing is just I added a list of five XY coordinate pairs. And the only reason I used five pairs, like you might be asking yourself, why five? Because I like there are only four different positions. The reason I did five is because um, in Python, like when you want to grab a certain item out of the out of a list, like the first item in the list is the zeroth item. The second item in the list is the first is that is has an index of one. The third item has an index of two, etc. And so. I didn't want to put 0, 1, 2, 3 just because it's a little more confusing. I wanted to put 1, 2, 3, 4. And so I basically just put a placeholder in the 0th position, OK? So this 0, 0 point never actually gets used. We're only using the items in position 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'll show you. This will make more sense, hopefully, as we go along. But let me show you what I mentioned, what, what I'm describing here. I'm just going to open a little program called the Python idle GUI, and I can create just a little list variable. And I'm just going to make a list of, of three strings, each one having one character. Um, okay. And so if I want to grab a particular item out of this list, 
like the list is just three strings, A, B, and C. If I want to grab an item out, I can put the index of that item in there. And you can see this is, if I put a zero as the index, it's going to grab out this particular item. If I put in a one as the index, it should give me the B. And if I put a two as the index, it will give me the C. So I, I kind of like this little, anytime you have Python installed on your computer, you can use this little GUI to check kind of Python features, you know, because that's a scripting language of Experiment Builder. Um, and so what we're going to be doing, basically, is from the location property of each of these um, image resources, what we're doing is really first making a reference to that overall positions list variable to its value. And then inside brackets, we're, reference, we're grabbing the value from one of those data source columns. So in this case, the target location column. Okay, And so you can see this number here is basically going to be end up being the number inside the brackets here. Okay, And so what we're doing is making a reference to that overall list of the five positions and then inside its brackets making a reference to the data source column which, spe which specifies the index to use. So in other words, it's kind of like if this X were our positions list, we're first referring to that positions list overall variable and then in brackets grabbing the, the index of the item we're trying to get out. Okay. Um, does anybody have any, if you have any questions about that, raise your hand or like, you know, type in a question because it's a little bit confusing at first. But the idea is like basically if I wanted to now go back and change the position, the like exact XY coordinate of each of these like four possible positions, then I just have to change it in this one variable's value. So I just change each of these four number or four x y coordinate pairs here, and that would change the positioning of the images for all of the trials. Okay, and so the idea here is like we don't we wouldn't then have to change it in each row of and each column. Okay, so let's go back here and let's check out one more of these um, just to make sure it's it's clear. So I'm, I'm looking at the phonological competitor. Um, image and let's just go and make the reference from scratch. So what I'm going to do here is delete that reference, okay, and if I go back to that it's going to show me like the current position on here, right, and as I move it around I'll change it. But we don't want to use that current position. Instead we want to grab one of the positions from that positions list variable. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is like get rid of all this, the hard-coded value, and then since I'm making something that's more than a simple reference or more than a simple value, I have to put in equals. That's just how Experiment Builder works. So the equals will say, hey, we're going to make some kind of complicated reference here. Okay. And so first I'm going to say, let's make a reference to our positions list variables value property. Okay. And so that's going to say, okay, let's grab, let's, grab the value of that, but let's grab a particular value out of it. And so I put that inside these brackets here. And inside the brackets, I want to put a reference to the data source column that specifies the phonological competitors, like kind of location code, one, two, three, or four. So I'll double click on that. And that means that for that trial, we're going to use um, value one, two, three, or four as specified in that phonological competitor location column. We're going to use that value for the index when grabbing from that list, positions list, okay? And we did a similar thing for each of these four image resources. So you can see each one of these is, is just grabbing a different um, uh, data source columns uh, value, okay? So that's how we're basically moving these things around from trial to trial. And then um, I added these interest areas and I wanted to make sure that the interest areas move around from trial to trial. And so for each of these interest areas, like I named one target, I named one phonological competitor, you can see it has three properties, location, width, and height. And I just referred to the actual image resources. Um, so this, Im so if I go back here, like what I did was, let's get rid of that. I just referred to the actual image resources 
location property. And so as that, as that image resource moves around, the interest area will move around with it. Okay, so this is a much, this is going to help us out a lot in terms of setting up the mouse triggers and in terms of data analysis. Like a rookie mistake that people make when doing visual visual world pro projects is to have like one interest area that's called top left, one that's called top right, one that's called bottom left, and one that's called bottom right. And so basically they set up four static interest areas. And if you do that, then when you get to data analysis, you're going to have to like decode like which type of image was in which each of the four positions and it's just a pain and so if I make the interest area be kind of linked to one of the image types and make that interest area move around with that image and similarly change size if it if I change the image size then I don't have to worry about like decoding which image was in which position for each trial it's already going to be there for me in data analysis okay <clears throat> so that is um, how we're moving around the images and the interest areas for them. Then after, so that's this one here, display images. And you can see after we present that, I have a little timer here that's 500 milliseconds. And then I used a play sound action. So I use this one here. And I ref, it has a sound file property. And I just referred to that data source column called audio file which if we look at it, you can see it just lists the name of the audio file to, to use and you have to make sure to include the extension and you have to make sure to be using names of, of audio files that you have imported into your library manager. Okay, so edit library manager and then under the sound tab, make sure you actually have the, the sound files in your library. Um, and so basically they get to see the images for 500 milliseconds before the audio file starts. Okay, and I like, I did it this way just because some people have ASIO cards and I, it'll make sense in a second. Basically, um, some people have ASIO cards and some people don't. And so in Experiment Builder, if you're on a Windows computer, there are two different audio options. Okay, there's ASIO and there's DirectX. ASIO requires a special audio card in your computer. And there's a list of all the uh, supported audio cards under the help. Um, thing under help contents installation when uh, when Windows PC system requirements ASIO card installation there's a list of all the compatible cards and those are the rows here and it lists which like which operating systems they're compatible with and you can like click on a card and it'll give you instructions for how to install it um, but anyways like just in Windows like the direct X audio driver has kind of poor timing and this is not related to this is not experiment builders fault this is a general windows pro problem and so this would go for any other experimental software too um, basically DirectX doesn't have good audio audio timing and so if you wanted to have really precise audio timing then you should use an ASIO card if that ASIO card is chosen as the audio driver under the audio section of the devices tab then actually a property will appear for each display screen action called synchronize audio and since I'm using a, an ASIO card I could have just checked that property and then made a reference to the audio file column of the data source from the sound file property which it looks like I already did that and, and just when I turned it off it was hidden but anyways um, I could play the audio by kind of linking it to this display screen action. And if I wanted it to start 500 milliseconds after the onset of the images, I could put sound offset of 500. Okay. But since some people don't have that ASI, ASIO card, like if you choose that, um, if I go to the back here and choose direct X as the audio driver, then you'll notice that that property is gone. Okay. And so for those people, they would have to use this other trick of using a timer followed by a play sound action. And so just to make this generalizable to everybody, um, I, I did it that way. Okay, and this will also work if you use an ASIO card. But anyways, we have a 500 millisecond kind of preview of the images. Then the sound file will start playing. And then you can see the next thing that happens is we have another timer, okay? And this goes back to that critical, that column called crit word time that I mentioned at the beginning, which is going to specify how long it is into each of the audio files before the critical word is spoken. And so you would have to open up the audio files, check the time when the critical word is uttered, 
and mark that time down and, and put it into this column here and use different values for each trial. But the idea is like, I'm really only using this timer trigger so that it writes this message to the data file at the point in the audio file when that critical word is spoken. And we're gonna use this, this a little message in data analysis to kind of focus in on that part of the trial or in other words to set an interest period we call it interest period in data viewer that is kind of like using that as an anchor point okay and so we could we could set for example an interest period in data viewer that starts maybe like 500 milliseconds before the critical word is spoken and goes to um, like two seconds after the critical word is spoken okay something like that <clears throat> and that way like when you go to like that will help you very much to create graphs like this one okay because you can then kind of center your graphs around that critical word point okay so this is super important like it's possible to add in this information after you've collected data, but it is so much easier if you do it ahead of time. So I would highly recommend to do this. Okay, so um, let me know if you have any questions about this. The main point of this is to write the message to the data file. So notice here I reference that data source um, column crit word time from the duration property of this. And also notice I just did this to be safe. Like this timer trigger should start immediately when this preceding action starts. Like the default value of the start time would be zero. But to be safe in case like people put multiple of these timers or something like that, I made a reference to that play sound action. Has a, it has a property called play start time. So I made a reference to that from the start time property of this trigger, of the timer trigger so that like if we had several of these timer triggers, we would then specify the time from the beginning of the audio file for each of the data source columns of the of those that are going to be referenced from those triggers. Okay, so I just did that to illustrate like, you know, anytime basically you have a, a timer trigger that follows an action, it's going to just start from the time it's encountered in the experimental flow. But I kind of wanted wanted to force this timer to start based on the time when the audio file starts and so if you had multiple of those that way each one will be kind of based off of the, the time when the audio file starts and not the time when the previous critical word was spoken. Um, let me know if you get any questions about that. Okay but then after that we go to just a little null action here and this is just used to help us organize the experimental flow and um, with this null action like you basically have to do that because we can't really connect this timer trigger to all these four um, mouse triggers and this is just kind of a little idiosyncrasy in Experiment Builder. It's this special action here that doesn't do anything. It just like kind of allows you to connect nodes in a certain way. So basically once that critical word has been spoken we just get to a point where we're then waiting for a mouse click. Okay and you can see each if I look at each of these triggers kind of like our invisible boundary trigger up here, each of these mouse triggers is linked to an interest area in the display images action. Okay, like so this one. Um, and so each of these little mouse triggers is linked to a different interest area and so that way each of these will fire when one of those four regions is clicked. And to make it do that we can check press events check position triggered and then change region type to interest area so that we're not hard coding like the pixel coordinates so that we're linking it or making a reference to an interest area and then choose the display screen action and choose the particular interest area that you want to use and I don't know maybe I should have gone back and changed this so it only file, files for left click so maybe I'll do that now just uh, button one is the left click so I'll change that for all four of these um, Oops because we don't want them to right click maybe. Okay, so I'll do that. And so after each, so if they click on the target, this path will be followed. If they click on competitor one, this uh, path will be followed, etc. Okay, after each mouse click, you can see we have an update attribute action that is gonna set the value of these three behavioral data variables. And these are gonna be written out to the, to the data file at the end of the trial. Okay, so 
for this one, if we click on its attribute value list, we can see region clicked is being set to target, accuracy is being set to one, and reaction time is being set to the difference between the time um, when that mouse trigger fired, in other words, the time of the click, minus the time that the images were presented, okay? And, I mean, this type of, this trick of computing reaction time, that's discussed in that, in this, um, sorry, back in this uh, video tutorial series, if you go in here, you can check out this um, behavioral data logging uh, section that describes how to do this type of thing in more detail. But anyways, we're setting uh, these three behavioral data variables, and if you look at the update attribute action following the other ones, they're just set slightly differently. So competitor, maybe I should change this to, to phonological competitor, something like that. And it's accuracy set to zero, and we're um, setting the reaction time in that way. And maybe here I'll set this to semantic competitor. Okay, set it to zero, compute reaction time, and then for this one it should be set to distractor and zero for accuracy and set the reaction time. Then after each of those we present a little feedback screen so if they clicked on the correct one, so if they click on the correct one there's only one way they can do that, so we've got one trigger here, it takes us to a screen that presents correct. If they click on any of the three incorrect images then they're going to see the word incorrect. And each of these uh, little feedbacks is going to, whichever one you go to, it's going to stay up for one second and then we're going to blank the screen out. And it's important to blank the screen so that the images don't linger while you're kind of getting ready for the next trial. Okay, and then right after we blank the screen, we can add a row to the results file. So in other words, each trial is going to have a row in the results file. And that's that thing I mentioned at the very beginning. It's at the topmost level I added here called results file, which will create a tab delimited text file. And every time we use one of these add to results files, it will add a row to that tab delimited text file. And so in other words, each trial will become a row in that file. And it's going to be, it's going to end up in this, this file is going to end up in the same folder as that sub, that subject's EDF file. After, that's the eye tracking data file after the experiment's completed. And if we look at its results file, I mean, if we look at the columns property of that results file node, we can see we've selected all of the data source columns and all of our little variable nodes and moved them over to the right. So each of these data source columns and variable nodes will become a column in, the, in that tab limited text file. Okay, so that's the structure of this project. And I would encourage you to like download this. And I've set it up so that it's in under the iLink section. It, or I didn't do that, but if you check dummy mode, then you can just run it on your own little computer. Like maybe you can, if you're interested in Visual World, after this webinar is over, you can, like at some point later today, I'm going to post this on that um, same uh, webinars thing. Download this, and then you can uh, play around with it and run it and see what happens. Um, but it's basically going to do something like what we saw at the at the beginning. Okay, so that's how you uh, can can kind of build up this this project. Any questions on that before we kind of talk about how to do the data analysis for it? Um, okay. Well, you can always interrupt me. So um, earlier this morning, I uh, collected just, did, I just did my, ran myself through this like a couple of times. Um, like if you're going to use, anytime you're using an experiment, Builder project, like anytime you're anytime you're kind of building an experiment builder project that you're going to use for data collection, you can use this test run to test the project. But after you have like made sure everything's working correctly, then to create a project that you'll use for actual data collection, you use experiment de deploy. Okay, so I deployed this project, and I've saved it just in this folder I call it Sucker Linguistics on my computer. I made I deployed it into this folder, and then I have one folder for the visual world, another for the reading project and if we go like this is the deployed folder that I created by using experiment deploy and when I did that like it created this folder and if you go in there you can double click on the executable file that has a little eye icon and that'll run the project and when you do it'll ask you um, maybe you can see
then it will kind of do a little run. And I did a couple of those runs earlier today, and uh, that's the one I just did. I'm going to delete that. And I named them uh, Visual World 1 and Visual World 2. And so let's take a look at just how we can extract some of those, some of the measures that we we'll need in Data Viewer. So just how are we going to look at the data? Um, and I know I scheduled this from 10 to 1 o'clock. Um, just to give you a heads up, like the reading stuff is a lot faster. Um, so the visual world is a lot more complicated. Um, I think we should have plenty of time. But if we do go over a little bit, you know, you can always check out. If you have to go somewhere else, I'll, I'll put the, the recording up and you can check it out. But anyways, let me let me open up a little data viewer thing. So I'll, I'll go start programs. I got, or actually I have it pinned to the taskbar. So I got, well, let me show you where it would be. Start programs, SR research, data viewer. Data viewer, okay, and you know, just to there's another webinar that introduces the basics of data viewer. So I'm not going to go through all the basics, but what I'm going to do is like make a new viewing session, and I'm going to import the two data files by using file import data. So I'm not going to do file open. That's kind of a rookie mistake. That would ask me to open a, a previously created viewing session. So this is like going to have all the subjects' data in one viewing session. That's the idea behind Data Viewer. So I'm going to go file import data, multiple iLink data files, and I'm going to find that little. Um, it's in psycholinguistics deployed. I'm going to find our Visual World folder. And you can see it lists the two uh, EDF files that it found when it searched that folder. And I choose import, and so that's going to import our two little runs. Okay, so this is our, the data I collected this morning. And um, in Data Viewer, this is the trial view window uh, that w allows us to visualize the data in different ways. The inspector over here allows us to kind of like navigate through different trials and different subjects. Okay. Um, and so we can see there are the 18 trials for, for subject one, and these are the 18 trials for subject two. So I can click on a trial to, to show that trials data in the trial view window. And in terms of the trial view window, you can, um, there are three visualization options. So this one on the left allows us to look at a time plot. Okay. So on this axis, it's called temporal graph view, this button. And, uh, this is time in milliseconds. This is position in pixels. And these buttons up at the top allow us to control what's visible. And so these are fixations. These are saccades. And then if I wanted to see a position trace, I could click on this. Um, it says toggle eye sample visibility. And then I could do click this button to see the X or the horizontal position of the eye and click this button to see the vertical position of the eye. Okay. And so you can see like there's some, fi there's a fixation, there's a saccade. So you can visualize the data this way. You can like click on this to zoom in on a certain section. Um, you can do that type of thing. So this is one option. Another thing you can do is you can go to the, to the trial animation playback and do a little playback of the trials events, something like that. Okay. Um, you can go to different trials and like look at the playback in different ways. Okay, something like that. Okay. Um, you can slow it down and you can save this as a video file. Or sorry, this one of these buttons here. Save the trial to a video file. You can save this as a video file. Okay, so that's another thing you can do. And this is the this button in the middle is a spatial overlay view. And so this is going to show us all the data in our currently selected interest period. So we're going to come back to this in a second. So over here, we're basically, right now, we're seeing all the data from the entire trial, which is going to be like all the data from the time when we start recording at the very beginning of the trial. So when we enter the, the recording sequence until we exit the recording sequence. So right now, that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing a blank background because we're going to see the last thing that the subject saw in that currently selected interest period, which is full trial period right now. And the last thing that they saw was a blank screen. Okay. And so if it's set to full trial period and you had a blank screen at the end, then you're going to see a blank screen here. And so that could be a reminder to you to set the interest period. 
Um, but let me, before we set the interest period, let me show you these same buttons up here that we use in temporal graph view um, can be used to, to, to change the visibility of different eye data types um, in the spatial overlay view. And so fixations are represented by circles and the center of the circle is the XY location of the fixation and the diameter of the circle would increase as the duration increases. So the diameter doesn't indicate spread of fixation, it indicates duration um, and the, the location of the fixation always is always the center point of the little circle. Okay, and so each of these is a fixation. We can see saccades with this button here um, and we can see a, a sample trace here. Okay. These little boxes here are interest areas and they came from our experiment builder project. So if I like um, expand the trial, for example, we can see the custom interest areas and, and like the, the target was over there. Uh, looks like I may have missed an R at the end of that one, but uh, final logic competitor there, something like that there, the semantic competitor there and distractor up there. <clears throat> so these were automatically loaded up because we created them in our experiment builder project. and. It's nice because across trials, you know, the target is going to move around to the dip. Okay, by coincidence, it's in the same location. But let me so see, target is now in a different location. So this is going to make our analysis a little bit easier. Okay, um, if you wanted to draw new interest areas, you can do that with these buttons. But since we've set it up already in the visual world thing, we don't really need to do that. Um, if you want to. Uh, focus in on some certain part of the trial, that's where the interest period comes in. And it's really almost impossible for me to imagine any scenario where you would not want to set an interest period. So in other words, you should always be setting an interest period. And I'm just going to show you how we can set an interest period that starts um, a little bit before uh, the, the critical word onset and goes to some amount of time after the critical word onset. So I'm going to go here, I'm going to click on this drop down and click edit and that's going to bring up the interest period manager, okay? And I'm going to click on the new button and this is going to allow me to create a new interest period. And if you're using older versions of the data viewer software, this interface like, might look a little bit different but the idea is exactly the same. So we've tried to simplify it in a new version that's it's coming out soon. Um, so. I'm using that version here right now, but we, we basically in the old version you would have a details tab where you choose an interest area or interest period type, and you, or sorry, you would have um, like a main tab where you choose choose the interest period type, and then you have a de details tab where you specify like this the kind of details of the interest period, and we've combined that all into one little interface here for each interest period, and so I'm going to create an interest period called like. Um, 500 pre and two th and let's do 1,000 post because I'm I might not have even waited two seconds to to click on some of the trials, but anyways, so the idea is like we're gonna have an interest period that's gonna start 500 milliseconds pre critical word and go to 1,000 milliseconds post critical word, and for the start event I'm gonna use one of the messages and I'm gonna use that message from our experiment builder project that marked the critical word onset, so I'm gonna use timer crit word and if I wanted the interest period to end with a different message then I would use the end event type as EDF message here but if I want it to end after a certain amount of time then I can do a duration down here and so I want it to end sorry actually I need to go back up here we need to change the start event offset to minus 500 so that we start 500 milliseconds before this critical word Okay, so that's the 500 pre. And then we want a duration of 1500. So it starts 500 milliseconds before and goes for 1500 milliseconds, which will make it end 1000 milliseconds after. Okay, and then when I click OK, we should then be seeing only data from that part of the trial. And we should see the images now because that's what the subject saw during that part of the trial. Okay, so that's how we're going to like focus in on the certain part of the trial and this affects not this interest period setting affects not only what we see in the interface here in the trial view window but more kind of critically it affects what we export what data is included when we create our reports 
And so, you know, if you've watched the other data viewer uh, video uh, webinar, then you'll know about reports. So we can export tab delimited text files that give us summaries of the data. And um, like a fixation report would have a file where each row is a fixation. And whenever you create a report, you get a little dialogue where you can select which columns will be included in that report. Okay. Um, we're not making a fixation report right now. Like an interest area report would have a different row for each interest area. So in our little example, we would have five rows per trial per subject because we had five interest areas per subject. Um, a sample report would give us a file where each row is a different eye tracking sample. And then critically, like in newer versions of Data Viewer, we've added this pretty sweet thing for visual this is like actually dedicated this is like based on visual world researchers so this is I can't like actually non visual world researchers probably wouldn't want to do do this but this there's a report a special report called time course binning analysis and so what what I'm trying to get at here and I'm kind of going to come back to this is like we want to make a graph that looks something like this and I in this graph I just had four kind of bins you know, but what, what what we're trying to do is like first set an interest period that's going to specify the entire scope of our little time window in our graph here. And so we're going to start 500 milliseconds before critical word and then go to one second after critical word. That's what we're seeing in, in a graph like this. But when you go to like actually look at papers and stuff that have done this, they're not just having four, they're not typically going to have four little four or four big bins here. They're going to have like 10 or 20 millisecond bins and they're going to have lots of them throughout here. Okay. And so what we want to do here is create a file where each row is going to be one of those bins. Okay. And we're going to have columns that are going to tell us like the percent looks to each of those um, types of images. You know, so we're going to have like uh, one column for the target, the percent looks to target, one column for the percent looks to phonological competitor, one column for percent looks to um, semantic competitor, etc. Something like that. Okay. Um, so we can use this time course binning analysis to do that. And something just occurred to me as I was doing that. I really want to get rid of this. Um, this interest area here because we're really focused in on these four interest areas here and this interest area actually falls outside of the scope of that interest period that we set up here because it came from the display cross action um, so it was actually before the images were presented so if I go to preferences tab I'm just gonna go down here um, to data filters and I'm gonna uncheck show interest areas pre interest period Uh, I'm just kind of like wondering why it's making our four interest areas disappear. Okay. Anyway, it's like, actually, let's not worry about that for now. Let's just leave this interest area in there. Um, I have to figure out why this is not why our main interest areas are disappearing. Let me check something. Like that. Oh, I know why. Because um, our interest period is starting after the little onset of the images. And so the message that indicates the interest areas happens just kind of this automatic message that comes from data viewer to the to the EDF file happens right at the time of the onset of those images and since our since our interest period actually is going to end up starting after the images onset when I exclude like when I go here and do data filters and and exclude the interest areas that are outside of our interest period I'm actually excluding the interest areas for those too so so what I mean what we could do is actually just get rid of this guy, do something like that, um, and like we could do that for several of the trials. Let's not worry about that too much for now. You can worry about how to delete those later. But um, let's go here and do analysis, reports, 
time binning analysis. Okay, and so what we're going to have is um, you can see we can specify a bin interval down here. And so that's going to specify the duration of each of the rows of the output file. So each row in the output file is going to represent a bin of time. And this here specifies like how long each of those bins is in milliseconds. And so if we want a 10 millisecond bin, we could type 10 there, but let's do 20. Okay. And um, you can see by default it includes the name of the EDF file, the trial number or trial label and trial index here, and the bin index within the interest period. So the first, second, third, et cetera, within the interest period. And then we can include some other variables that are going to be like um, like I was tracking the left eye both times here. So I could include several variables here that are going to tell me about um, the eye data for that bin. So this is going to say, for, for example, for left blink sample count, it's going to tell me like how many samples in that current bin were there where the eye was in a blink. Okay, so for that row, for that bin, how many samples were there and it, I was sampling at 500 hertz, so that means there should be 10 samples in each bin. So each sample duration is 2 milliseconds, and we have a bin interval of 20 milliseconds. So we should have 10 samples. This will tell us how many of those 10 samples were there where the eye was in a blink. Um, we're going to have um, like average X position, Y position for the samples in that bin. But then critically down here, this is where we get into the important stuff. This is going to tell us like, if we scroll up, we can see the definition. Total number of samples in that current bin that fall into uh, a given interest area. So this, the inclusion of this variable is actually going to create a different um, column for each of our interest areas, okay? And it's going to tell us how many samples there were um, for, like, for each of those interest areas for that bin, okay? So we're going to include that, and we're going to also have another variable that's going to tell us the percent of samples that were on that interest area for that bin. And we have, I mean, a lot of these different variables. You can, you can read through the manual and read about these different variables, but I'm going to focus in on these because those are the types of ones people tend to use. And if you wanted to do things like um, not um, include samples that are off the screen, so if the subject's like looking away from the screen altogether, then if you choose this option, it will exclude those. If you choose this, it will include all samples regardless of whether they're on the screen. If you choose this one, it will make sure that they're only samples that are on the interest area. I'm going to use the default. Um, there's a, Also, you can do some filtering here about whether the eye was in, like filter out um, the fixation samples. I mean, fil filter out the saccade samples, so you can do something like that. I'm going to include all of them. But anyway, so then I'm going to go to next. I think, let me just make sure I've included all that. And maybe we can also, these blue variables, we should include those. Those come from our data source columns and variable nodes here. So data source columns and variable nodes in the project will become blue user-defined variables. So I, I can add those and those will become, co oops, I should select all of those. Um, I'll exclude positions list, but we can include all those as columns as well. And then I can go to next. And actually, I, there's an option here where you can create a separate report collapsing data across all trials in the same group. Um, this is if you want, if you have like a group, uh, something that's like identifying a group of trials, then this will create a different report for each of those groups that's done the averaging for you across all the, the trials in that group. Um, I'm not really going to do that right now because I'm just going to show you the main file, but um, you can, if you wanted to do that, this is similar to like the ag function in SPSS if you use that. It's basically a way of kind of like doing the averaging across um, some grouping variable and creating another report that has that average data. So in the end, you might want to do something like that, but I just want to show you the basics of what's going to be created here. So I'll go to next, and it wants me to save the viewing session, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to save it in our little folder, um, Psycholinguistics. I'll make a new folder, and I'll call this like visual, VW for Visual World uh, Viewing Session, something like that, and I'll go in there. Oops. 
wrong folder. Go in there and I'll call it Visual World One. Okay, something like that. So I save the viewing session and it's going to ask me to save the output file and I'll save it as um, Time Course One. Okay, and when notice that it's asking me to save it in a certain folder, you can see when I created that. When I saved the viewing session, it actually created a subfolder called output that's in that viewing session, and that's the default location where the, the, the reports are going to go. So I'm going to save that one, and now if I go into um, our folder that I just created, we can go into the output folder, and there's our, it's a tab delimited text file. I, by default, it, it gives it an XLS extension, so I can open it with Excel. Um, I'm trying to hold up a second. Let me close down this. Oh, okay, so there it is, and you can see each of these rows is going to be a bin. You've got the bin index here. So right now we're looking at one trial, one subject, and there's the second trial starts there, and you can see we've got um, these different interest areas here, and let me let me point out like I didn't get rid of that center interest area for all the trials but you should do that and I'll show you in a second how you can do that but basically because the, the reason why it's important to do that is because that center interest area if we go back and look at it it actually had the same index like if I go in there and look at the fixation cross like it, this one had I could have like maybe given this a different index and would avoided this, but it had the same index as the target in, uh, interest area, and so you probably want to filter that out first, but um, so that that doesn't get collapsed or something into this. But basically, we have a column that tells us like um, how what's the number of samples within that bin that were on that interest area. And that we have a different column for each of the interest areas. The zero is going to be for samples that were not on any interest area, okay. And then we also have a column for the um, the percentage. It's actually a proportion, but you, you get the idea here. So for interest area one, this is the proportion of samples for each bin that were in that interest area. And so I'm sure you can imagine, like you can pretty easily go from something like this to something like um, this, okay. And if you wanted it to do the collapsing across the different trials, then you could you could do so that way. Um, let me just show you. If you wanted to uh, quickly delete that interest area, this is a nice little trick to know about. If you wanted to delete that center interest area for like all trials or all um, trials of a certain type, let me show you what we can do. We can go to Edit Trial Grouping, and I can group by, for example. Um, these location columns. Okay, something like that. And now for each of these groups, what I'm gonna, what I can do is just select one representative trial. So this is like showing me the position of all four of the different things. I'm just gonna select one representative trial in that. Select that little interest area that I don't want. Delete it. Okay, and I'll save this interest area set to disk and I'm just going to save it like on the desktop for now and I'll just call it like 1, 3, 4, 2 because that's the grouping value up there. Save it like that and it's going to ask me do you want to re-import it into the viewing session so we can use that as a template and I'll say yes and now if I, if I look those other trials within that same group still have that center interest area but if I go back up here to that overall grouping value and then select my little template that I just created then it now applies it to all the trials within the group and so you can do something like that for your different groups to get rid of that that little problematic interest area pretty quickly um, and then when you create the report you don't have to worry about that the ones with the interest area index of one being collapsed okay so um, I think that's the basics of of how to do the visual world type of stuff um, does anybody have any questions Okay, um, I'm not seeing any hands go up or any questions being asked. So um, you can think about it. Why don't Why don't we take a? Uh, I'm getting. A, I, I got 11:33 on my clock here. 
Um, and I know maybe some of y'all want to go to the bathroom or something. Um, I know I do. But anyway, so let's take a, a five minute, let's resume at 1140. So let's take like a six minute break and um, and start back at 1140. And at that time, we'll talk about reading studies, like how to program it and how to do the data analysis. So take a quick break and resume. I'm going to stop recording. Okay, so in this section of the webinar, we're going to talk about how to kind of build a reading study. The, we're going to go over just kind of the relevant parts of, of in terms of like reading specific aspects of Experiment Builder. Um, if you want to get a more kind of basic introduction to Experiment Builder, then um, you, I would highly recommend to go to sr-support.com and then go to this video tutorial section and you can watch these it's like a 11 it's about an hour long total but you can watch this and download the this, these videos describe this very simple project here and the reading example that we're about to talk about it's so similar to this I mean the only the, the main difference is really that we're presenting text instead of an image and that we have some interest area issues to kind of deal with and think about. But other than that, it's very similar to this, so I would encourage you to watch this if you're not familiar with the basics of Experiment Builder. Um, you can also um, go to the webinar section, and uh, a few weeks ago I did like a, another kind of webinar that was an introduction to the basics of Experiment Builder. Um, we're going to be talking again about Data Viewer, and my colleague Sam, um, he's excellent, he did this uh, webinar on that introduces the basic concepts of data viewer so I, I would encourage you watch these webinars watch those video tutorials if you don't if this is all new to you um, and I'm, I'm gonna try to like focus on the relevant parts of of a reading study like not all the little details about uh, recording reaction times <clears throat> um, or at least not the level of detail that I normally would go through so let's, with respect to reaction times, so let's um, go and look at this PowerPoint first. I made a little PowerPoint to describe this experiment builder example that we'll talk through right now. And again, I'm going to like post uh, these, this reading example and the visual world example that we did earlier. I'm going to post those in the same webinars uh, forum where this, where this webinar was announced. So um, let me start this slideshow. Hopefully it'll work for y'all. Um, Okay, text with copy. This is just a simple experiment where on each trial, the, the participant would give, be given a sentence, they read the sentence, press a key, and then read a question, and then respond with one of two keys, like Z for true or slash for false. And um, I should have brought this up first. So on each trial, the participant will read a sentence and then answer a question about it. After they answer the question, they'll be given some feedback um, telling about whether they were correct or incorrect and we'll make sure that the project is set up <clears throat> excuse me set up so that it creates interest areas automatically for the text in the in the experiment and in this case you don't have to do it this way but in this particular example I set it up so that each word will become a separate interest area and it'll do that because it'll look for <clears throat> it'll use a space it'll look for a space character as a delimiter character um, in determining the boundaries of the interest areas. And so since in English um, spaces identify separation of words, each word will become a separate interest area. Uh, let's see what else we got. So the trials will be divided into four blocks. Four blocks. Um, one practice block and three experimental blocks. I should have put a space in there. Uh, the order, the practice block will always come before the three experimental blocks and the order of the three experimental blocks will be randomized, trials within the blocks will be randomized. If you want to learn more about, I'm not going to go through the details of the randomization scheme, that, that video tutorial series I mentioned earlier describes that stuff and it's the exact same concept. Um, and you can make different counterbalances or lists and do those all within the same project so that you're not, like if you had four different counterbalances, <clears throat> A rookie mistake would be to make like four different experiment builder projects, but then that's just a headache if you decide like you want to change the font size or something like that. So <clears throat> it makes programming a lot easier if you if you 
build all the different counterbalances or lists into one of the projects. Um, then after we kind of talk about the programming of it, we can talk about how to extract the like certain reading measures. So there, you know, like there's been a ton of work on eye tracking during reading, and researchers have come up with some very like specific dependent measures. Um, and I, I just put a link here. I'll, I'll post this PowerPoint, and you can check out the link. But basically, on our forums. Um, you'll see there's a page where we have definitions of a lot of different reading measures as the reading community um, tends to kind of operationally define them. So I put one example up here, gaze duration, just to kind of illustrate how specific these measures are. So this would be like if you had a region that was like a word, one word region, for example. Gaze duration would be the total duration of all the fixations on that word until the eyes moved to a word that was later on in the text or a word that was earlier on in the text. But if you skip that word during first pass reading, then there is no gaze duration for that trial. Or you either can treat it as missing or as zero, and it's up to you how to do that. But anyways, let, let me just go to that section of the forums because um, we're going to probably come back to it. So if I go here under SR Research, we can go to the data viewer section. And we made it sticky, actually, reading measures from data viewer. And so <clears throat> you can look at this, uh, these different measures. Each of them has a definition here. And then down below, I describe how we can get those out. And we'll come back and talk about this later. But I just wanted to give you kind of like a agenda for what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about how to get these different measures out. So <clears throat> excuse me, I got some frog in my throat or something. But let's go to uh, the project. So this is the Experiment Builder project. I call it text comprehension question. And it's pretty simple, actually. So at the very top level, let me close this down. At the very top level, um, we present some instructions. And I just put some placeholders there. You can you know, edit the multi-line text resource to change the instructions. But we present some instructions wait for a certain amount of time, 10,000 milliseconds, or for a key press, and then go into camera setup so that we can calibrate, validate, you know, set up the participant. Once we're done with all the eye tracker setup, we can press O and then start the experiment. And this experiment, you can see it has a block sequence here, and it has an iteration count of four, so this is gonna iterate four times. And on each iteration of this, we're doing something similar to what we did in the visual world thing. We're going to check that current block iteration value. okay? And if it's 1, we're just going to go ahead and start the trials of the block. If it's greater than 1, or not 1, I should say, then it's going to go on and present a break screen okay? and wait for key press. And then we're going to hit the trials. And this is the thing that's going to handle our looping. So it's a lot like that visual world example. So you can see we're going to do actually four. Uh, 14 trials for each participant, and there are two lists, so that's why it says 28 there, but we're actually only going to do 14. We're going to do two trials in the first block and four in each of the other uh, three blocks. And if we click on its data source, <clears throat> we can see, let's talk about the columns in this data source. So each row is going to represent a different trial. Um, we have two counterbalances, so this is, this is one counterbalance here, and this is a second counterbalance here. So we got a unique identifier here that just helps us kind of have some unique value to identify each trial. And I probably should have used different values for the second counterbalance, but that's up to you. Um, we have a column that literally just has the text typed in. And you know, if you don't want to use this editor, then you can copy and paste from Excel, or you can use the import data button, and you can import a tab delimited text file where the first row of the text file has the co column names and the additional rows have the values for each of those columns and the values will be separated by tabs and the column names will be separated by tabs and you can import it that way to create the data source. <clears throat> I think in this one I just copied and pasted from Excel. Um, I did this actually a few weeks ago but this is the text to be presented, and if you look at this, like you're going to see there are a lot of repeats. I didn't want to like come up with a ton of different unique stimuli, but 
obviously you can imagine how to change the, the values of each of these to change the sentences from trial to trial. And I actually um, kind of ripped this off from from my dissertation work, which which was just on sentences that contain relative clauses. So you can see here, like, the banker that the lawyer praised. So that the lawyer praised is an object relative clause. And that knew the reporter in this one, that's a subject relative clause. <clears throat> Maybe you don't care about that, but anyways, I made another column that indicates what type of sentence each one is, and that's that's useful in data analysis to help you do your novas or whatever you're going to do. So this, the values of this column would be available in the output reports from Data Viewer, and I made another column. So in this in this uh, work, it was like a manipulation of the frequency of uh, the noun phrases, and so you can see these have low frequency noun phrases, and this one, apprentice and dictator. I just realized that sounds awfully like, relevant to our current political situation in the U.S., but um, <laughs> that, was, that wasn't intentional. Anyways, uh, this is just meant. This column meant, is meant to just encode whether the noun phrases are high frequency or low frequency. And then there's a comprehension question. So there's a column that's going to be referenced um, to present the comprehension question. And then this column, okay, crit word. This is super important. Um, so basically, like, I set it up so it's going to do, we're going to talk about this later, but so that there are going to be interest areas around each of the individual words, okay? But um, when you do the data analysis for a reading study, you might decide that you want to kind of, like, combine interest areas across, like, combine several interest areas to make one kind of phrase level interest area. <clears throat> Or you might want to have like the critical, maybe in, when you set up your stimuli, the critical interest area kind of shifts positions across trials. And so what I tried to do here was have a column, and we'll talk about this more in detail when we get to the data analysis part, but this column is just meant to identify like the word number or, in, or more like correctly, like the interest area index of the critical word. And so since I did the interest areas at word level, which we'll see later, I coded, so in this one, word six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So praised maybe would be the critical word. I just made up these numbers. So this is these aren't legitimate values. But the idea is like if your critical word shifts across trials, then having a column that identifies the position of that critical word will help you a lot in data analysis so that you can like quickly just focus in on that word regardless of its position in a particular trial. So you're not going to have to do a bunch of selection like, okay, in this trial, critical word was number seven and blah, blah, blah. It's like you code that ahead of time to help you in data analysis. And it will make more sense when we get to there. But basically all this is is the word number of the critical word within each trial. And if you had several critical words within each trial, then you could have several of these columns. Okay. Then I have another column that just codes whether the correct answer is false or true. So they're going to get a true-false comprehension question. And then this is the key that they should be pressing. And so I just set it up so slash corresponds to false and Z corresponds to true. And then these three columns are just used to control the randomization scheme. And so we got practice are going to come before non-practice in each counterbalance. So practice come first and then non-practice. And then we have a block column that enables us to group the experimental trials into blocks. And this is exactly like what we did in the visual world paradigm, and it's exactly like what is in that um, in that video tutorial series. There's, if you wanted to focus in on a particular video, it's called uh, I think it's like called uh, randomization options. So that'll describe that. <clears throat> okay, so then we got. And the counterbalance. So we can just, that's the the splitting column. So if we go in here, that's the thing that's going to allow us to choose whether we're going to use counterbalance one or two, and it'll give us that choice at runtime. Um, and so if we ran this on each trial, you would actually like see a sentence and see a drift check and answer the question and then get some feedback. So let's take a look at the um, the individual trial structure. So we, we got the break at the beginning of the block, and then on each trial, we're going to do the prepare sequence just so, like we would in any other experiment, go to example, and then we do the drift check. And notice, like, I have repositioned the X location, Y location of the drift check target 
so that it is at the location of the first word of the sentence. This is so that when they start the trial, they're not like fixating on some position that's like really far away from the location of the first word of the sentence and have to make some like huge eye movement back to the beginning of the sentence that you would have to filter out later. So all I'm do doing there is just trying to control where they're looking at the beginning of the trial. Okay, and I'll show you how I chose that in a second. So if we go into the recording sequence, this is the thing that handles the actual recording of eye data on each trial, and it, it's not doing any looping. It just has an iteration count of one, but this has the actual trial events, and if we go in there, um, you can see just like in some of these other projects, we reset the values of, we got these behavioral data variables here. So we got one for sentence reaction time, one for question reaction time, one for accuracy, and one for which button they pr pressed or which key they pressed when uh, they responded to the question. And so if we look at this one, we're resetting the values of each of those variables to just some kind of nonsense, meaning, meaningless value which could help us with debugging or help us to discard trials where they timed out, okay, <clears throat> without responding, something like that. Okay, so what we're going to do here is first, after we reset the variables, hit this display sentence, fill out the messages, and if we go in there, you can see I've added a multi-line text resource, okay, and when you click this button and then click the, here, it brings up the multi-line text resource editor. And like with this thing, I mean, you can can just come in and like type whatever you want, right? But I mean, usually we want the text to change from trial to trial. And so you can use this little button here to make a reference to a data source column. So if I click this button, it's going to bring up the usual attribute editor that we see when we're making reference um, from other parts of a project. And you can see we can find like the trial data source. And if we double clicked on the sentence column, this shows all the columns in the data source. If we double clicked on that, then it would add, like instead of seeing this, we would see the sentence here. Okay, but I already added one of those references here. It's kind of weird, but in the interface, it's not obvious that you can do this, but if you double click on that, it'll bring you back and let you see what that reference is to. Um, and it's also not obvious, like I set up the font to be Courier New because it, in Courier New, like the width of all the characters is the same. It's called a fixed width font, and a lot of times people do that in reading studies because they want to control the, the width of the characters. Like an, an example of a non-fixed width font is like Times New Roman. So like, oops, like let me just show you quickly. Um, this is kind of a consideration in reading studies. <clears throat> so let's do a little Times New Roman action. And you can see like the L's are skinnier than the O, for example. And then let's do a, a courier new. And we will see they're all the same width. <clears throat> so a lot of times people want to use uh, that type of font. And so that's what I chose here. And I chose a size of 20, and I chose triple spacing. So in this example, I think the sentences all ended up just being one line. But in some reading experiments, they might go to multiple lines. And I would recommend to use as big of a line spacing as you can just to help it to help you distinguish which line they were reading when you go to do the data analysis. Like if, you get, if you're good at doing calibrations and you know all the tricks, um, to get a good calibration, then this is not as big of a consideration, but um, I just like to do this to be safe in case maybe you get a bad calibration with a subject or something, then you'll have a big kind of margin between the lines and it should be easy to know, like for a given fixation, which of the two lines it was on. Okay, so I will recommend to do triple if possible. Um, and it's not really obvious from this, but if I wanted to change this font after the fact, I could click and drag and it doesn't look like it's selected, but it is. And if I change the values up here, then that would actually change the text that is going to be presented here. So if I change the font or the size here, that would actually change that. So that's how you can change it without having to delete the reference, change the settings, and then add the reference again. I mentioned that. I didn't know that for a long time, and I discovered it. And I was like, oh, my God. But anyways, that's useful to know. Um, so we're going to display the sentence, and critically... For this display sentence, if we select the multi-line text resource here in the structure panel, 
you see here this property use runtime word segment interest area. This means basically, do you want to like automatically create interest areas for the text? And yes, we do. That's actually the main like that's one of the main advantages of using Experiment Builder as a programming tool for reading studies is because like creating interest areas for text like manually after you've collected data is not <laughs> nice okay and so this is a huge feature and um, let's go and look at something so if we go to edit preferences this is where we can change the settings of this segmentation of the interest area segmentation so if we go to the word segment section almost at the bottom of the preferences interface you can see so you can set the margins here above you know left and right above and below and you can check fill gaps between which will like if you know if, if that's turned off and you have margins of zero then the, the interest areas will be like tight right around the words and though if you have a space then the interest areas will not extend you know halfway between halfway into the space that's between characters if you have fill space fill gaps between checked then the interest areas will extend to fill in half of the space that's between the characters and it will extend above and below the lines. Um, if there's like a two or more lines of text, then it will extend vertically to, to fill in the gaps um, between lines of text as well. So that's a nice feature. <clears throat> and here you can change the interest area delimiter character. And so I'm using the default, which is a single space. And I'm using delimiter replacement so that they also see the space, OK? Um, like if you wanted to go ahead and like from the from the get-go set it up so that your interest areas are at a phrase level then I, I just made a document some like in your data source you could type something like this and put a special character where you want the interest area boundaries to be okay I didn't do that in this example like if we look at its data source I didn't do that you know I just typed them in normally but you would put those that spe the text with the special characters at, at the location of the boundaries and then you could go down to preferences and then for the delimiter character put that special character and then replace it with a space so that they don't so that the participant doesn't see that so you could do it like that um, or like if you want it to be at every character you could do something like this and notice I kept the space there and then under preferences you would put the delimiter character there and you would uncheck delimiter character the limiter replacement because we want to just remove it and not replace it with anything. Um, but in our case, we don't want to do that. We just want to stick to a single space. So I'm going to do that. And so that is going to allow us to automatically generate the interest areas. So that's hugely important. Okay, let's go back here. So we present the sentence and we wait for either a key press, any key on either the keyboards, or for a timeout of 20 seconds. If they press a key, then we're going to compute the sentence RT variable up here. We're going to set that to be um, the time, the difference between the time when they press the key and the time when the sentence was displayed. Okay, and that's described in that video series under the behavioral data logging video. Um, then we're going to present the question, and this is like the exact same type of thing, except instead here we're making a reference to the question column of the data source. Okay. So that's going to present the question, and I didn't care. Like in this example, I, I was just like, I don't care about where, what making interest areas for the question. So I just left that unchecked. Okay, but if you want to, if you were going to do analysis on the questions, you would want to check use runtime word segment interest area for that as well. Okay, so we present the question, wait for a key press or a timeout. Okay, and if they press a key, we're going to check to see whether the key that they pressed match the correct key column here and if so we're going to set the values of the variables to as they should be when they respond correctly so set accuracy to one set another variable that keeps track of which key was pressed to just the trigger data key and then compute the reaction time as we normally would and then do if they if that's not true so if if the key that was pressed does not match the data source column that um, stores which key should be pressed. Then we follow the little X mark path here. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. 
and set the variables identically except accuracy is set to zero. Okay, and then give a little feedback, incorrect or correct. So that one says incorrect and this one says correct. And then leave that up for one and a half seconds in this case and then blink the screen. Okay, so you can see like programming a reading experiment is actually the programming part is quite easy. You just need to make sure to do the interest area creation um, and you need to make sure you're storing your behavioral data variables. But this part is actually pretty straightforward. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, so um, I'm not seeing any questions. So let's focus in on the data analysis for this. So I actually, I, I, um, I'm going to open up data, I'm going to close, I'm actually going to open up the data viewer and do file new to make a new viewing session. And let's save the changes to that visual world one that we did. And I made a new viewing session. And now, if, let me just show you what I'm doing here. Like, I deployed the project earlier. You know, as you'll, if you know about Experiment Builder program, you know when it's time to like collect data, you go experiment, deploy. You can do a test run to just take, test to make sure it's working, but you want to deploy it when you're ready to collect data. And I deployed this earlier today, and um, I deployed it to this folder called Deployed here, and there it is. And I ran this deployed project twice and created these two um, data files. And so from Data Viewer, I'm going to go File, Import Data, Multiple iLink Data Files, and I'm going to find that folder. It's in the G drive, um, psycholinguistics, deployed, text comprehension question, deployed. And you can see there are my two little EDF files, and I'll import them. Okay. And now we can see the, our data. And um, I'm not going to go over all the details of, of Data Viewer, um, but we're looking at the spatial overlay view, which is this middle view. And we can go through and look at the different trials here. And we can see the fixations. Um, if you want more details about data viewer, you can go back to the to the webinar that I mentioned before. Um, you can do playback of the trials, something like you know, see that, and it might look a little bit jumpy. On you. I don't I don't know how the webinar is going to make it look, but you can see the playback. Then um, you can see a time plot if you want to look at it that way. But really, like what we're want to do from data viewer is somehow get our reading measures out okay and so the first thing we want to do is make sure that we are excluding parts of the trial where the sentence was not being presented okay so you know in our in our experiment we present the sentence then we they press a key and then we present a question and then they respond and then we blank the screen. And we probably only want to look at the data for the period of the trial when the sentence was on the screen. So this is where the messages come into play and these are super important. So we're going to use this message here and this message here for the question to set an interest period. So I'm going to go back to data viewer and I'm going to go click here where it says full trial period. Click edit to bring up the interest period manager and I'm going to make a new interest period and I'll call it sentence period. And as I mentioned in the visual world part, like this interface, we've updated it recently to make it a little bit simpler so that there aren't multiple tabs anymore. Uh, but on old versions, you have to specify the details of the interest period under a details tab. Uh, but now we put everything all together. So we put kind of like the label and the details all together. Um, but anyways, it's the same idea. We're going to do a sentence period, interest period. We're going to start at the message display sentence, and we're going to end at the message display question. OK, something like that. And click OK. And now we should be seeing the text. So we should be able to sit, not only just see what the subject saw during this period of the trial, but also when we create any of our reports from data viewer, we're going to be able, we're going to only see the data from that interest period, okay, from that portion of the trial. So the interest period is absolutely critical. You've got to do that. Okay. If you did create interest areas for your question period, then you would want to go under preferences, 
data filters and make sure to uncheck show interest areas pre-interest period and show interest areas post-interest period because you would also see the interest, period, interest areas for the question part of the trial and you would want to exclude those using that. But in our case, we only have interest areas for the sentence part, so we get that's good. Okay, so now let's get into how we get to those reading measures that we mentioned earlier. So if we go back to our, um, let's go back to the forums and let's go into the data viewer forum and go back to that post that I mentioned, reading measures from data viewer. So this list here, it's actually a list that um, I kind of came up with, I, I got a lot of help from one of my old colleagues named Yoon Hyung Lee. He's a um, really bright guy, uh, has done a lot of research in eye tracking and reading in Korean and some other stuff. But anyways, we kind of both like went through the literature and identified like measures that people talk about and use. Like this, these are the common measures that, that reading researchers um, tend to talk about. This is largely based on work of like Keith Rayner and um, Simon Liversedge and some and some other reading researchers. Um, but you can see like they have very specific definitions and these are, I'm not going to try to comment on like what cognitive processes these represent in terms like some of, some people say like certain measures represent like maybe lexical access or like phonological like identification or these different processes, right, or um, maybe phonological identification in the right word, but like there are different stages that people talk about of, of where you can, I, like how you're processing the information in the text. I don't think it's really my place to comment on that type of stuff, but some people have tried to map these measures to those different processes, and I'm just trying to say, okay, if you want to get these measures that people talk about, here's the operational definition of these measures in this first post. Okay, in this next post, I'm saying here are two methods for getting those measures. And so Data Viewer is a general purpose tool. It's not just for reading studies, okay? And so if you wanted to get at, um, you know, certain variables that the reading community talks about, those variables aren't going to have the same names necessarily in Data Viewer. And so what I tried to do here was say, like what the ver what the reading communities measures are called, and then how these map onto data viewer measures. Okay, and so this is saying if you want to get these measures that are described up here, then for a given measure you can you can make an interest area report, and you can include the variables that are listed here. And if you see something that says like if this variable equals that, and this variable equals that, then that means after you create the report, the interest area report, you'll need to open that report in a statistics program and just do a little bit of selection to select out cases where these if, where this conditional kind of qualification is not true. Because some of these measures um, only count if the region was not skipped during first pass reading. And so the idea here is to, like this interest area first fixed progressive, that variable will tell you, like for a given interest area, was that interest area skipped during first pass reading or not, okay? And so sometimes you have to do a little bit of selection after the fact. But basically what this is saying is you can go and create analysis reports interest area report. And anytime you and and then you can include certain variables to get these reading measures that the community talks about. And anytime you create a, an interest area report, each row of the output file is going to be a different interest area. And so you're going to have a set of rows for a given trial for a given subject. And each row for that trial are, is going to be a different interest area. And in this case, it's going to be a different word. And so I might want to include variables like interest area index, which would be the number. So D would be one, barbarian would be two, et cetera. Um, that's the number of the interest area. And you can include interest area label, which is going to be the text. Okay, that's when, when Experiment Builder creates the interest areas, the label automatically becomes the text of that interest area. Um, and then you can include, like, you can include your user-defined variables that come from your Experiment Builder project. Okay, that'll help you do your NOVAs or whatever and maybe have your behavioral data there alongside of your uh, reading data. And then you can include 
these measures that are described here. So if I wanted to get gaze duration, for example, I can include interest area first run dwell time and interest area first fixed progressive. So up here, I might find interest area first run dwell time. Include that. And maybe I'm going to move it to the left a little bit in our output file. And I can use these buttons to move things left or right. And I can include interest area first fixed progressive. Okay. And I'll move that next to, it doesn't really matter where you put it, but I'm moving it next to the first run dwell time. And so then I would create this little report. I'll save the changes to that same folder. I'm, I'm saving the viewing session. Um, so I'll call this uh, reading. Okay, something like that. And I'll save it save this as IA report one okay and now I can go to that folder where I just saved this viewing session here go to the output folder and there's our little report and it's just giving you a warning because it's actually a tab delimited text file it's not a true like Excel file or whatever but Excel can interpret that fine but it's just giving you a little heads up um, and so you can see each row is going to be a different interest area for a given trial, for a given subject. And like over here, we have the interest area first run dwell time. And if we just open this in like, I'm opening Excel, but you can open it in SPSS or R or whatever, MATLAB, and just do a little selection to make sure that it wasn't skipped during first pass reading. So anytime it's one, then that means it's okay. It was not skipped. But if this, if this variable first fixed progressive is zero, let me see if we can find one. Um, I, I probably didn't actually because I remember when I, I was the subject and when I did the reading, I don't think I did many regressions. Um, so there probably won't be a lot of zeros in here. But if they, if it, like let's say you skip a word and then come back to it, then the first run dwell time is going to be some, the sum of that first run of fixations. I'll describe what a run is in a second. And the... Um, but that first run will will have occurred after a fixation on text downstream or that's progressive to the to this region and so selecting that out will make sure that we're getting true if this were zero and selecting it out would make sure that we're getting true gaze duration because if we look back at the measure gaze duration says provided that the first fixation on the target region does not occur after any fixations on words further along in the text. Okay, so you would have to do just a little bit of selection, but basically this little mapping tells you what data viewer variables map to each of these reading base um, measures. Okay, so just to, to clue you in to what a run is, um, like, because you'll see, if you're looking at an interest area report, you'll see a lot of variables have this term run. A run is like, let's look at the, there's a nice little thing in the, in the, in the data viewer manual. If I go to data analysis and output interest area report, I think it's in here. Um, so here's an example that can tell you about a run. So if this is the series of fixations, fixate here, 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 and here, like, these, this is two fixations on the same interest area. So we, let's imagine the interest areas are at the word level. These two fixations would be considered a run on that interest area. So run is a series of consecutive fixations that are on the same interest area. And so then, so then the eyes leave that region and go back to this one, and then they come back to pathless. And then they leave it and go to land and then come back to pathless. And so this interest area has three runs, this run, this run, and this run. And the first run has two fixations in it, fixation four and fixation five. The second run has one fixation, fixation eight, and the third run has one fixation, fixation 10. And so gaze duration in this case would be the sum of these two fixations because they're the first run on this, on this interest area. Okay, so that's all that run means if you see that anywhere. Okay, so um, if you basically, if you're happy with how your interest areas have been defi defined, so in this case they're defined at the at the word level, 
then you can just use this first technique that's mentioned in this forum, method one, create the interest area report, include these variables, and just do a little bit of selection to get at these reading measures. Okay? If you decide that you want to expand the region, so maybe I decide I like I want to look at a region that includes these four words, for example. This is this could be like the RC region, or maybe this, like maybe just these three words is the RC region. And I want to include this as one big region and get gaze duration for that, for example. Okay. Um, there, there are several ways to do it, and I'm going to describe the hard ways to do it, and then I'm going to describe a tool that I made to make this a little bit easier. Maybe you want to use it, maybe not. It's up to you. But um, I know that when I was doing uh, research and I was looking at RC structures and I looked at some other structures too, um, if, I if I did comparisons like from an object extracted relative clause to a subject relative clause, for example, and I looked at like the embedded noun phrase across those two conditions. Um, if I just looked at one word com reading time comparisons, I was, ne I was never finding any significance. But if I grouped the entire embedded RC, so it would actually be this, I think I messed up earlier, it should be these four words. If I grouped those into one region and then compared that the reading measures on that entire grouped region across subjects, you know, across conditions, I mean, then I would find like P levels less than 0.01. So I would find huge significance when looking at an interest area that was like an entire region, uh, but I wouldn't find them at the word level. And I think this makes sense if you think about like a relative clause structure. So like, first of all, if you compare across conditions and you're just looking at a one word region, that one word region would be in different sentential positions across subjects or across conditions I mean um, so it kind of doesn't make sense in that way to compare across conditions the same word um, in, in, in fact it makes sense to kind of compare a grouped region because this will have the exact same words but only in a different order across subjects but anyways the, the point I'm trying to make is like when we're reading sentences and I think a lot of people have shown this like you can look at the literature we don't tend to find like precisely pinpointed um, like effects of where like when you hit that word everything all of a sudden becomes difficult and the reading times on that specific word are going to reflect all the difficulty differences you have across conditions like that's just not how it goes most of the time in cases where you have like a garden path sentence which would like an example of a garden path sentence would be something like the as everybody probably knows this, as Sally rode the pony broke into a cantor or cantor, however you say that. So this is a famous garden path sentence. So you think, as you read this, you think the pony is the object of road. But when you get to the word broke, you realize actually broke is the, like the pony is the subject of this embedded clause here. And the pony is not actually an object, but it's a subject. And so in these garden path sentences, you might find a kind of like very localized effect on this disambiguating word. But in a lot of sentence, sentence structures, like sentences containing relative clauses, you're going to find more dispersed effects. And so you're going to find that you might have to be doing some grouping. And I'm going to show you how to make that grouping easier. So one way you could do the grouping is you could in data viewer select the interest areas right click and do merge and that would make these be into one big interest area but then you would have to make sure to apply that to similar trials across subjects which would involve regrouping the data by some variable that identifies similar trials across subjects so maybe like the sentence variable and then so this is Oh, sorry, I didn't group that right. Edit trial grouping, group by the sentence. Okay. And you can see now I, I changed that for one of the trials in that grouping, but you can see it didn't change it for the other ones. So I would then have to save this as a here, save it as a template, and I could do 
something, save it to the desktop, maybe like Barbarian. This is saving an interest area file that has the interest area information. Save that, and then it says, do you want to add it as a template? I say yes, and it still doesn't apply. You have to come to the overall grouping value and select that template that you just saved, and now it's applied to all the trials within that. Okay, so that's one thing, but if you look also, I mean, maybe this is okay, by you but you can see like it kind of changes the indexes and that's probably okay but you can imagine how this process would be a little bit tedious okay and another way you could do this and I'm not even going to get into all the details of it because it's I don't think you would want to do it but you could go back to your original project you could go through here add the asterisks in the location where you want the new interest areas to be go back and change the um, the word segment preferences so that it uses the asterisk here and then run the project and when you run it it will generate IAS files and if you turn off the trial randomization then you would know which IAS file corresponds to each sentence and then you can come back back to your viewing session of already collected data group it by the sentence import by using import data interest area template import all those interest areas that were created from your little dummy run through your experiment builder project and then apply them like I just did. Okay, that's you can imagine that's tedious too. And so what I did here, or I did a few years ago, is like create this program called Git Reading Measures. Okay, so um, it's described in method two here, and you can you can get the you can download it here. It's with there's a Mac version, a Windows version, but basically the way this works is instead of creating an interest area report, you actually create a fixation report and you include certain variables here when you create the report and you take that fixation report and run it through the get reading measures program and then specify what the boundaries are for your region so what the word number boundaries are and then output a report so let's let's try that okay so i've i've got if i go back to this to this project like let me just before we try it let me show you if you're going to use this get reading measures technique, you would go here and you would not have done what I just did, like do all that grouping. So you would do all the merging. Instead, you would go analysis reports, fixation report, and you would create a fixation report that includes these variables here and that also includes any of the variables you might need. Sorry, let me bring that back. That you might need when you're doing the comparison across conditions. So you might have to like include, in my case, um, NP type and and uh, something else, sentence type. So if we go back and look at that project, you remember I had this NP sentence type which tells me object versus subject and NP type. So these would help me do my comparisons across conditions like an ANOVA or whatever, t-test. Whatever. So under here I can include these variables in addition to these other variables that, oops, in addition to these variables here that we would include. Okay, so we would create a fixation report like that, and then you would run that through the Git Rating Measures program. Okay, so let me go back to, to our folder, and I've actually set up the Git Rating. I've already downloaded it and put it in this folder, and if I go into that, this is the little, if you double-click on that, Git Rating Measures.exe, it brings up that, that um, that program okay and so what you're gonna do is like first select that fixation report that you created as the input file and I'm not gonna I didn't create the fixation report because I know that get reading measures comes with an example fixation report I'll just I'll show it to you like I'll open it up um, like open it with Excel and you can see this is the like you would have a fixation report that looks something like this and you include those variables that were mentioned here Okay, and so you can see that report that I just opened up here. Where are I? Too many, ver too many things I open. So th there's the fixation report, and you can see it has um, these variables that are called for. And you can use that fixation report as the input file for Git reading measures. So I'm going to go and get that, that example fixation report. And then I can create an output file, and I'll just call this like, Let's let's do a one-word region 
that is always interest area number five, so word five. Let's do that first. So I'm going to save that file. I call it region five. And, for, and here you specify the critical region start word and critical region end word. So this is like the interest area number. And in our case, that's the word number. So if I go back here, this is going to, let me choose one that has like it not grouped. That would be one, two, three, four, five. That, for this trial, it would be this word. Okay. So it's, it's good. what we're going to do when we run this program is it's taking the fixation report as the input making an output file that you specify here and computing all these reading measures that are selected for the region that you've specified here. And so in this case, it's going to create an output file where each row is going to be a different trial. And you're going to have the, each of these variables here is going to become a column that gives you the value of that reading measure for the region that you specified here. And if I click process data, it's going to make that little um, file for you. And there it is, and we can open that up, um, and you have the reading measures for region, for word five for each of those. All right, so I know that's not useful, that's yet, okay? But what we can do here is I can say something like this, five to seven, and then change that, change the name of the file here, and you don't, you don't have to close this, and you can make a new one, okay? And now this output file, is going to have the reading measures for that read for each trial for that re that three word region starting at word five and going to word seven. Okay, so it would be like five, six, seven. It would be this three word region. And let me just point out that you might think, well, why don't I just make like a, an interest area report using method one that we talked about earlier? Why don't you just make the interest area report? and then select the rows that are for words five, six, and seven, and then add up gaze duration and consider that to be the gaze duration for the entire three word region. And it doesn't work like that because if you think about the, me the, the definition of gaze duration, it's the sum of all the consecutive um, fixations until you leave the region and then it stops, okay? But you can imagine if it's a one word region and you leave that and go back to that, region then this let's say we had a bunch of fixations here and we had one and then we have another one here and then some more fixations here if it's a one word region that second run of fixations is not going to count but if it's a three word region including these three then that second run of fixations will will count and so it's not enough to just add up the gaze durations for the for the smaller interest areas that that are making up the larger region. Okay, I just want to point that out. Okay, but anyways, so what you're going to get here is a file that, like this, this, this is five to seven. So this is the, each row is a trial, and you have the reading measures for that region. Okay, but even this is limited because in some cases, like, your critical region might shift positions across trials. So maybe, like, in one trial, the critical region will be like words four to six. In another trial, they might be words six to eight, something like that. And so that's why I created this crit word column. And this can be used as like an anchor point, okay, in the Git Reading Measures program. So if I like, if I look at the um, the original fixation report that that comes with Git, this example one, you can see it has a column called crit word. And it's similar to what I just did in this example. So this column identifies the, the word number of the critical word for each trial in case the critical word is like changing positions across trials. Okay, so you can come to get reading measures and instead of using like hard-coded specific values, you can use a reference to the value of that crit word column. And you can do something like this, plus two. Okay, and then when you make the output, I'm sorry, maybe I should. Two, two, to post two or something. Then it's going to create an output file that has a three word region starting at the crit word. 
you know, and that is, can change across trials, and then going to two words after the crit word. So when we open up that um, output file, this is going to have for each row or for each trial, it's going to have the reading measures for that three word region that starts at, at the crit word and ends two words beyond the crit word. So that's why I said it's really important to include this type of crit word column when you create the experiment builder project because that way you'll already have it as something that you can include when you cr when you make your fixation report you can already include in addition to the variables described here you can also include your crit word column here and then use that crit word column when you're specifying the region for the get reading measures program so that's a way you can use this program to like very quickly like expand your your region to look at reading measures over multiple word regions and I think this is a lot faster of a way to do it than going back and like redefining the interest areas as you can see I did that in like five seconds as opposed to like probably 30 minutes or so um, but anyways I think this is like a nice little tool that you can use um, to do some kind of exploratory measures or to even investigate like different types of of grouped regions of words that you might have um, like a priori like you decided you're going to investigate in your data analysis um, but anyways does anybody have any questions about this process or any specific reading measures that you might want to get okay it's a very quiet group today um, well, I, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover in terms of like data analysis for reading studies and how to program reading studies and just overall the, the psycholinguistic stuff. If you have questions and you know you didn't want to ask them here or, or they come up later or whatever, then you can always send an email to um, let me just type here, send an email oops, to support at sr-research. Dot com. That'll go to me and to all of my colleagues and you know whoever's available or whoever might have the expertise in that area can write back with a response to your question. We take support super seriously and we do our best to respond to people and help them out in any way we can. So I highly encourage you, like don't be shy, like contact us with questions. Also, if you want, you can post on our forums. You know, if you have an account there, you can post your questions there. Um, that way, if other people have similar questions, they might be able to read it. But it, you know, the fastest way to get support is probably to email support at sr-research.com. Um, but if if there are no more questions, then I guess this will be the end of the webinar, and I will post these videos at the same location on our support forums where the announcement of the webinar was. So I'll post these videos um, in here. Um, sometime in the next day or two. So thanks thanks a lot for attending the webinar and look out for ones in the future. If you have suggestions of topics that you want to see in future webinars, please send us an email with those suggestions and we'll try our best to like include those or address those topics in future things. So we're, we're trying to make this be an ongoing thing where we uh, do like maybe one or two of these uh, periodically, like every month or so. so you know, don't hesitate to let us know if you got any suggestions. And thanks again, and uh, hopefully I'll hear from you soon, or hopefully you don't have any problems, but hopefully I'll hear from you if you do have any problems. All right, I'll say bye now. <laughs>